Welcome to The Waiting Room Revolution. We're so excited to announce our book, Hope for the Best, Plan for the Rest, Seven Keys for Navigating a Life-Changing Diagnosis, is available now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Get a copy wherever you buy your books. And check out our website, waitingroomrevolution.com, for more information. But I think the harder part maybe is the actual conversations that, that need to take place, the, the hard conversations that need to take place. Because it's really, I mean, a human life is not just about our assets and our decisions about our assets, but it's really about our relationships. And, and those conversations are also difficult. That was Jia Ying Tei, whom I met at a conference in Singapore earlier this year. Jia Ying worked as a producer for an arts-based community engagement project called Both Sides Now, which led her to palliative care. She founded Happy Ever After, a service that provides end-of-life planning and leads death cafes. We discuss why she became an end-of-life doula in Singapore and how Asian culture intersects with dying and death. Hi, I'm Sian Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Xia Ying, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so Thanks for glad, having me here. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you here. We, I was at a, a conference in Singapore the Advanced Care Planning International Conference, and I heard you speak, and I was just so excited to have you as a guest. So I was very moved by your talk, and so I want to, you know, share some of um, your experiences with our listeners here. And I thought we would start with telling everyone that you are an end-of-life doula in Singapore, and that's what makes you so interesting. Um, we've never had, and uh, someone from Singapore, you're the first on our podcast, and, but before you were a doula, you actually sort of started this journey into end-of-life care as a producer for this organization called Both Sides Now. So can you tell uh, our listeners, what is Both Sides Now? Okay, so actually Both Sides Now, it's, uh, it's, an, an, uh, it's, a, it's an arts-based uh, community engagement project. Um, and it is uh, co-produced by two companies in Singapore. One of them is Drama Box, and another one is called Arts Walk Collaborative. So since about 2013, um, we have been engaged in these large-scale uh, arts, multidisciplinary installations in the community to basically open up conversations and uh, bring awareness to end-of-life issues to the wider public. Uh, we always thought that these conversations needed to happen not just in intimate places, but really it's a shared community experience. So uh, it started in 2013. It's still going on. Yeah. And it has so far, I think, I think it has undergone about five iterations. Is that right? Let me count. Yeah, around four or five iterations as of now. Yeah. That's amazing. And for someone who hasn't, um, you know, been to this, like what would, if they went to one of the, the installations, what would they experience? Okay, so um, first, let me just plug their website. <laughs> you can yeah. find out about them. They have a YouTube page. Uh, it's uh, the handle is both sites now SG, uh, and you can find their website both sites now dot SG. So uh, both sites as in life and death, and now in the present, right? So both sites now. So uh, what you actually experience is uh, actually a multidisciplinary. Um, installation, uh, which includes like what the, uh, visual arts elements, uh, films. Uh, we also have theatre performances, and one of the one of the one of the things that is uh, also present at these sites are these um, what we call interactive uh, artworks, incomplete artworks, <laughs> where we need uh, audiences to come in. To complete the artworks yeah so we would set up a prompt they'll come in they may make a windmill but in the process of making a windmill they get to reflect what would they want to hold on to remember uh, forget and I can't remember what's the last question but you know you, you think you think through some of these life and death questions as you participate in those artworks and what have some of the reactions been to these kinds of community art projects? 
they have generally been positive. Um, I think that anyone who chooses to step into this space is at some level, <laughs> this is my belief, at some level prepared to at least start engaging or have some curiosity in, in this. So I think what has been, uh, it has always been uh, a very heartwarming experience. Uh, we've not had anybody who has really broken down or caused a scene, you know, as in people think that, you know, death is a taboo subject. There will be people who may be aggressive about it, but no, it has always been stories, uh, community, basically sharing of experiences, learning together, I think. Uh, and I think one of the things that arts does is that you can actually, it, it's kind of a medium that you can experience through it so that it's not so personal and hits you, but it still hits you right there where you need to be to contemplate about your own life and I guess own death. Yeah, so it's, it's I think it's a safe place where people come together and and share and share yeah i think i mean this idea of arts arts which has the ability to tell stories in so many mediums can be such a powerful thing um so i you know i've always imagined this you know being everywhere but uh you know thinking of how that can be done is a different story but the question i wanted to ask you was um um so how did that experience translate into you wanting to become an end-of-life doula in Singapore? Okay, so I'll answer the in Singapore part. I'm based in Singapore, so I can only practice in Singapore. I'm not going to migrate somewhere else to be an end-of-life doula. Okay, um, but anyway, uh, I think, um, okay, so that started in 2013. I journeyed with both sides now for about seven years till about 2019, 2020. Uh, where when when I I then left uh, drama box, so I I continued my participation participation as an audience definitely. Um, I think in twenty thirteen, um, another miracle or another project, uh, started at the same time, and it is called Project Baby Emma. So I was I had my daughter in the same year, uh, as both sides now, um, and basically I think that there was this, this, and this journey that I was going through with both sides now at the end of life, but I was also having a separate parallel journey with my daughter who is growing up and living life and experiencing life. So I do think that the two experiences coming together uh, did something. Uh, I, the, my journey is not exactly linear in that, oh, okay, now that I am done with both sides now, let's become an end-of-life doula. It wasn't, it wasn't that straightforward. And in fact, um, when I kind of decided to become an end-of-life doula, I didn't know <laughs> that the profession existed. Yeah, so um, the, the story is quite amazing. Um, I actually uh, basically just woke up one day and, and as I opened my eyes, an epiphany kind of just struck where uh, the thought that came into my mind was that I wanted to be an end-of-life doula. Uh, I didn't know what an end-of-life doula is, uh, but I think that what that word translated to me, as in I knew the word doula from the birth doula context, I may have read about end-of-life doula somewhere, but I can't point back, I can't go back to that article uh, or that YouTube or whatever, I don't know. Um, but the idea that I had in my mind or in my heart or in my body that I felt was that I just really wanted to accompany someone at the end of life. Um, and I think because that, that feeling was so special that immediately I went into research about like what is an end of life doula. Oh, there is such a thing called end of life doulas. There are end of life doula courses. There is a whole world that I wasn't uh, aware of previously. So I think that's how the the journey actually started as an end-of-life doula, but I think it was baked in my experiences uh, over, especially over the years leading to it, uh, whether it was with my daughter um, or with both sides now. I think, I think that with both sides now, I think both sides now is definitely uh, one very key ingredient to this because I'm basically 
thinking about end of life day in, day out for my work. Uh, and my work used to consume me um, in a way that work always does. So you are, I'm actually looking at everything uh, with this end of life lens. So for example, with my daughter, um, her growing up years, I, I started to realize that, hey, actually as a parent, our main responsibility is to not let the kid die, <laughs> right? Whatever that we're doing, um, we're keeping, trying to keep the kid alive is the kid, kid. Is the baby eating, sleeping, pooping? You know, all these questions are really to basically make sure that this kid lives, continue to live, right? And that's a really huge responsibility. So with raising my daughter, I think I, I it became very, uh, I became very conscious about every moment with her also. I have so many questions about this idea yeah. of, um, you know, I know that there are end of life doulas and midwives in the UK and in Canada. I think they're called yeah they're called end of they're also called end of life doulas. Yeah. Death doulas. End Death of life. doulas. Yeah, that's right. But I guess I'm I'm curious of in many cultures this idea of talking about death, preparing for dying is taboo to talk about. And I can say from my experience with my Asian relatives, they you know, are very resistant to making wills or talking about it because they feel like by talking about it, it will actually, you know, superstitiously uh, increase the likelihood that this will happen. So I'm curious as, um, you know, either from your own experience or from others, dualists uh, that you've met, like, what is it like in an Asian country um, being a, a doula? Do you think it is uh, different? I guess maybe it's hard to answer that, but I mean, how what, how does the culture play into this? Wow. Uh, okay. I, I don't know whether I can speak <laughs> very much to the comparison. I can probably speak better from my own experience. Um, I think that I, I believe that death is a difficult topic to talk about everywhere. Yeah. Um, I guess it plays out slightly differently. But I think that the taboo is always there. Um, in terms of, I guess, the culture that I come from, um, yes, there is this superstition that if I talk about it, then I would jinx it, you know, and it would happen or, you know, or it's bad luck, right? Whatever it is. So, uh, and I, I, I believe it exists in different shades and different forms in other cultures as well. Um, I think that uh, death in general is just something that as humans, we are naturally avoidant about or that it is just not urgent. And while, you know, cognitively, um, everyone knows it's important to talk about it. They don't feel the urgency. Um, so I was just uh, thinking about my okay, so when I started uh, my end of life doula journey, I actually uh, asked my friends and family, like, does anyone want to come come and <laughs> be my case study, and uh, and let me do an end of life planning session with you? Um, there's one particular friend uh, who I actually approached. He's the first person I approached the moment the idea came about, um, because uh, he's a regular um, supporter of our Both Sides Now project, a close friend. And every time we go to uh, the Both Sides Now, uh, we attend Both Sides Now together, we would inevitably talk about his insecurity or his anxiety, not insecurity, his anxiety about not having done his end of life planning. So he really wants to do a will, he wants to do his ACP, you know, LPAs, whatever. Yeah. So, um, and every year I would, I would, pass him links, I would even uh, give him, I think I gave him a contact number of a lawyer friend who could possibly help him. And then the next year would come and can I have the lawyer's number again? Can I have the links again? So this went on for like the entire seven years that I was doing both sides now. So when I thought about becoming an end-of-life doula, uh, at that time I was I was in between jobs, or rather I was unemployed. I wasn't, I wouldn't even call myself in between jobs. I was just unemployed. And I kind of like, okay, how do I do this so that um, I don't stress myself out? Um, and I think one of one of the things that I told myself as a success indicator of 
how successful I am as an end of life doula or in this end of life project is that if I manage to complete uh pre- complete the preparation of the of of my friend's end of life uh plans, um then yeah, it would be considered successful. So we went into it. And he is someone who is super efficient and he has thought about this for seven years, right? He has a clear idea of what he wants. So we met, I met with him and his partner. And from the day of the first meeting till the day that we finished the last administrative task, uh, it took a year. So I, I just had lunch with him yesterday and I was sharing with him about this analysis. And she, he, he, his reflection was that, yeah, it's, it's important, but it's not urgent, right? And there are, there are a lot of, and it's not very coordinated, uh, my role was really to help him like, get the contact of a lawyer, get the contact of, uh, of a doctor who could sign his papers. right? And without that, it's just like, it's a very huge administrative hurdle to do all those things too. And, and I guess there are also lawyers and doctors who, are to, who don't want to talk about it, don't want to do this work for you. So then, you know, there is also, there's a lot of, uh, I guess opportunities for rejection or failure and it's just a huge mammoth task so I think even for the converted it may not be easy to to do this wow you said something that is really interesting you know and it's you said that for healthy people advanced care planning or the short form for that is ACP is something that if we get our messages right people will see it as important but not urgent so something like a living power of attorney or an LPA will be something that will be more urgent for someone after they have a diagnosis of a serious illness. So I think that's such an important thing for the waiting room revolution, which is really targeted at activating patients and families after a diagnosis. I mean, th- th- there, is, there is a population of people who are... Uh, who don't want to talk about it, don't want to plan for it. And there is a population of people who want to do it, want to plan for it, uh, but just haven't gotten around to it. So maybe I can share the little survey that I did at the ACP International Conference. So I, I, I did, uh, after my, my talk, I made everybody uh, stand up and do a survey. Basically, I ran through, I think, five or six questions related to end-of-life plans. And in a room full of ACP advocates. Um, I think we had what two or three people who have completed all the tasks, and about fifty percent were el- eliminated by the first question of "Have you done a will?" Right. So, yeah. So I think that there is there are different segments of the population and different readiness. Uh, and I would say that even if um, we're not afraid to talk about it, the systems. Uh, the processes are not set up in a way that is easy for us to get things done. Um, I think administratively that is one that is that is one part, but I think the harder part maybe is the actual conversations that that need to take place, the the hard conversations that need to take place, because it's really I mean a human life is not just about our assets and our decisions about our assets, but it's really about our relationships. And, and those conversations are also difficult. You know, when you were, when you were talking at the conference, you shared the story of um, also the personal piece of trying to talk about this with your parents and the mm-hmm. journey that, um, that they went through. Do you feel comfortable sharing, you know, sort of the, some of the different parts of that story with, because mm-hmm. um, they did evolve, right? I mean, sort of maybe was it yeah. your your sort of persistence or there was a change in their thinking. And I, I thought that was interesting because it was, this isn't just sort of, um, this was also very personal in some ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think one of the other ingredients <laughs> to why I became uh, an end of life doula was probably um, an anxiety that I had. I mean, knowing and being exposed to end of life uh end of life the end of life issue uh in my work makes me think about like my parents end of life plans and uh yeah and it's just not easy to 
raised the issue. Uh, I actually tried to talk to my brother about it because I thought that maybe he would, I can gang up with him and then we can go and talk to my mom and dad about it. But when I spoke to my, my brother, who was two years older than me, he was like, oh no, we shouldn't, you know. You know? So I think there is, there is this general fear, I guess, of even just talking about it. I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I think that there is a huge anxiety because I, 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 I didn't know how to raise it to my parents. Uh, they are we're from a, quite a traditional, uh, conventional Chinese family who don't like to talk about uh, bad things that happen in the family. So I think that counts as that. Um, so I think, uh, I think sometime in the middle of my both sex now journey, I can't remember what year it is now. I think it was around the fifth year of uh, the both sex now journey. So that was in 2018. Um, I was, so my, my grandmother-in-law just passed away. Um, and she actually, uh, she, she lived with Parkinson's disease for the last part of her, 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 her life. Um, and, and I think because of her religion and also because she had so much time to prepare and think about it, and it was inevitable in a sense, although it, it is inevitable for everyone, but it's more inevitable for her and it's coming sooner, right? So the urgency is there. The entire family planned for her end of life, uh, uh, her, a plan for her end of life. And um, we basically, they basically uh, got everything in order. They knew what exactly to do um, when she passed, after she passed, who was the funeral director, who needed to come in and do what chanting, you know, everything was prepared. So her, her death was at that time when I was, I think, I think at that time we were, we were thinking about a new iteration of, uh, as in a new project, a new mini project as part of the both sides now, um, uh, engagement, uh, and, that really hit me as something that, oh, this is a very, very well-planned end of life. And this would be, in a sense, the golden standard, right? Um, and then I, I thought about it and I'm like, okay, I, I want the golden standard for my family as well. So I start, I texted my mom and I'm like, hey, can we talk about it, right? Um, so I didn't realize at that moment that uh, on the same day that I texted her, my uncle fell from I think he was trying to reach something tall and he fell and then he broke his arm and basically there was a crisis in the family uh, I think around the same time um, I think my brother was was having some medical issues as well and was causing some worries so basically not a very good time for my family <laughs> but I think okay the, the uncle thing I didn't know right but I just thought that you know when would be a better time I don't know I mean if I wait till after the funeral, would I still have the opportunity, right? So I kind of, when I, when I wrote her the text, I sent, I sent her a text message. I didn't dare to talk to her directly. So I, I sent her a text message and, and, um, and I asked her, can, like, I, I, have, I told her I have seen this. I met my grandmother's in last week. I think it's beautiful. I wish to talk to you and dad about um, your end of life plans. Can we? Right, and then she didn't reply. Uh, and she read it, but she didn't reply. And then I was like, okay, three days of uncomfortable silence. Uh, I decided to text her again, and I'm say, I, I told her, you know, it's okay. I know that a lot of a lot is going on. Um, so yeah, if you are ready, come talk to me. So that was in 2018, and yeah, she read that second message, and she also did not. A reply and we did not talk about it when we met so it's like oh okay so I, I got it as a, a very strong hint that don't bring it up so I didn't bring it up so it sounds like you left it there for a long time sometimes things just stall and end there and it was only until last year last September um, my my uncle he was uh, writing in he wrote in our group our family group chat um, to publicize this like webinar or seminar that his company is organizing about some end of life matters and end of life planning uh, matters and asked if anyone wanted to sign up. It was a free webinar. 
And my mom was the first one to sign up. And I was, when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> is this really happening? <laughs> like, is my wish going to come true? <laughs> so, um, so after that, um, I, uh, after the webinar, I, I noted the date and I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask her about it. I'm going to take it slow. So a week after the webinar, I asked her casually, oh, how did it go, right? And then if you had any questions, you can ask me. I am kind of an expert here, you know. So she kind of also just, oh, yeah, it was all right. We're thinking of doing it, but, you know, okay. So then a few more months passed and nothing happened. And I'm like, okay, when is a good time to bring it up? And then I think, okay, so in Singapore, there's this thing called the lasting power of attorney. I don't know what's the equivalent in Canada or the Western. Um, but uh, so in Singapore, the government is subsidizing uh, the application or rather sponsoring the application fee and the deadline was coming up. So I think my, I, I, I don't really know what's, what are the conversations that are happening at my mother's generation, but it seems like they are all talking about this. I think post- my uncle's uh, webinar, right? And a few of them, I think, have already signed their uh, lasting power of attorney. So I think I overheard a conversation between my mom, my dad, and my uncle just inquiring about the LPA. And, uh, and that's when I knew that, oh, okay, something is still brewing. Okay, so I would butt in once in a while and I'll ask a little bit more but I didn't dare to <laughs> overstep my boundary too much. So then it was, I think, a few weeks ago that we finally uh, finalized the papers for, for the two of them for their LPAs. And then we also had a family conference with my siblings, my mom and dad, to basically share that this has been done, who are the representatives, right? What are our wishes? Um, very briefly, and oh, these are, um, these are, this, th these are the decisions that we have made, uh, and yeah, this for everybody's knowledge. So I thought that like from twenty eighteen till now, that's like five years. We've made huge progress, but also in a very short span of time, right? So I I find that maybe once people decide to do it, then and they have that that resolve to do it, then it can be done. But until that point. You know, it's a lot of coaxing, a lot of really just taking the lead of the person. Yeah, because, yeah, suddenly my brother was fine talking about it because my, my parents were the ones who initiated it. I think that there is probably a fear of from him to, to raise the issue to, their, to, to my parents as their child, right? It may be, maybe it's just, I don't think he... He, he thinks that he is cursing that there, but, you know, but there is just this reluctance to bring it up. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, this whole time when I was doing Both Sides Now, I would advertise that we're doing Both Sides Now is on end-of-life preparation. You know, come. And they have come for a couple of performances, actually. And I was like, talk to me about it. But they don't talk to me about it. So, so that, that's my journey with them. Yeah, and and what and and they know what you do. So and you've never talked about what you do. Or it it's never come up. I would explain, and yeah. then they would not seem too interested to continue the engagement. I said, there is always this sense of reluctance. I think, mm -hmm. like, okay, mm -hmm. I know that you're trying to do something. I'm gonna be supportive. Um, I don't, as in the sense that I get, and I have never verified it with them. Mm -hmm. The sense is that, uh, yeah, we'll support you. But I'm yeah. I'm not gonna ask you too much about it. I don't know. I is don't there know. is there a growing community of of end of life doulas in Singapore? Have you ever met with other certified so, doulas? As far as I know, uh, I am the first one who. Okay, I I I believe that other people may have gone uh for such courses because along the way there would be people who would message me and say that hey I am I am in the process of getting certified. I have attended a course you know so there are I think individuals doing that but I don't think anyone has gone as far as me to <laughs> set up a website and, and publicize to the whole world that hey I'm an of life doula and you know try to try to make it uh, uh, uh try to create a service around it yes. yeah yeah so, well you actually got training right and certification yes I, I did yeah I did. yeah yeah, yeah. And part of your, 
your advertising was to, especially during COVID, was to do online chats. And you created, your website is called Happy Ever After. I'm yeah. so curious how you came up with that name. I, it, it struck me. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, I think I, I think as in, I guess, I guess it comes from the fairy tales, right? Happily Ever After. What does it mean? to be happily ever after. Yeah, yeah no, I yeah. mean, the reason why I sort of asked that question is because um, I can talk a little bit about what we do. I mean, we found that the, the kind of concept of palliative care is scary to people. Mm -hmm. And the waiting room revolution, a lot of the work is about deconstructing the elements of palliative care or a palliative approach to care, which is really just the elements of good care and good information and teaching, coaching, patients and families how to leach out this approach, even if they meet healthcare providers who say, oh, I don't do that, or you're not ready yet, or it's not time yet. So we found language to be so important, which is why we didn't call it a palliative care revolution, because nobody would sign up. But somehow mm -hmm. when we, you know, called it waiting room revolution, and our, and our um, keys that we teach people are metaphors that are not, it is about being sick, but it's not about death and dying in the way that people think about it. So we've been really conscious of language, you know, guided mm. by the patients and families who said, I wish I had a roadmap. I wish people told me what I wish I knew. So we framed it that way. And we've had a lot of success in people being excited to use this. And the and I would, so that's why I just thought, you know, happy ever after yeah. is just a very um, welcoming name that is not scary. Yeah. And I wonder if you felt that that has helped to contribute to people joining this online forum in Zoom, yeah. I personally just really liked the name. Uh, I liked it that it was happy. I liked it that death doesn't have to be sad, as in death can also have happy elements. I think that's that's what it is. Um, I think that for me, celebration is another thing that comes to mind, that the celebration of someone's life uh, versus the mourning of someone's end I think that we always focus on the morning and the bad parts, but really this person has lived a good life. Let's celebrate it. They completed the journey. Um, so I think the, the happy ever after, I mean, ever after like signifies the end. So I think there, there is all those things that come into happy ever after. So there is actually a Chinese name that I came up for this. Are you, are you fluent in Chinese? Mm -hmm. right? I, I can yeah. understand Mandarin. Understand. Yeah, I can't read it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, the Chinese name of my organization is called Zhong Sheng Da Shi. So Zhong Sheng Da Shi in, in uh, when it's written as Shen Ti De Shen, it's, uh, it means marriage. <laughs> Right, and Zhong Sheng Da Shi is Zhong Sheng is the end, so mm. the big event at the end of one's life, right? And then, as in, so I came up with the English name first, and then I came up with the Chinese name, and I thought the Chinese name was more apt, but it was very interesting that both of them were related to how we, as in, the 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 the, the terms are usually associated with marriage, mm -hmm. and. For marriage, there is a lot of planning and, you know, it's actually also an event that we come together to celebrate something, yeah. right? And I saw that that parallel with the end of life as well. There's so much planning and actually, yeah. what is a funeral? A funeral is a celebration party for someone, yeah. right? I mean, of course, I wish that the person who we are celebrating is there. Um, and in fact, I would advocate for a pre pre-death funeral i don't yes. know what they call the a last party right yeah with everyone a life there. celebration or a living memorial celebration yeah yeah that that yeah so so there are all these uh, as in there's something that uh one of my uh co-producers at both sex now always talks about uh i guess in life there are so many things that we plan for so at the end of life, we don't, we, but we don't plan for our end of lives. At the start of our lives, we plan mm -hmm. for the arrival of a baby, right? Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we, we do everything that we can, knowing that it's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know it's going to impact us. But somehow at the end of our lives, we don't do that same planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, there you go. The name of, of my organization. And I'm so curious, like the conversations in the Death Cafe, do you feel like they are... I mean, I guess it's hard to know, but do you feel like there is a cultural element? Like they're very Singaporean in a way? I mean, do you think that it's different 
or do you feel like the questions in your, in your death cafe, cafe are universal? And if you went to Sweden or Canada, death cafe, you would hear the same people asking the same kind of questions. Okay. Um, so I, I, the, the simple answer is I don't know. <laughs> I have not been to enough uh, death cafes overseas to, to get this, get a good sense for a comparison. Uh, but I think one of the things that I wanted to highlight about the Death Cafe that I organized, it may partly be because of, or rather I attribute it um, to the crowd that actually comes to my Death Cafe. Um, so I have, I, 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 I only publicize on two sites because I'm lazy. <laughs> one is this uh, website, this uh, Telegram chat group called Open Geo. Okay, so Open Geo is basically uh, is, a, is a Singaporean slang to say that come along. So it's like an open invitation to come along. And it's a, it's a telegram chat that is uh, kind of a, a publicity. They, they share about events that are related to social um, issues or social, social things. Yeah. So uh, I decided to go there and the crowd is mostly youngish. So I'm around 40. So I think it's me and younger and maybe a bit older than me. So maybe between the, the uni students and the almost 50s, I think, mainly. So I publicized there and then I publicized on deathcafe.com. Uh, so I have, on my first uh, Death Cafe session, it was very interesting. I had like, one or two people from the US. Yeah, because uh, I, I had uh, the time zone, as in I, 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 my death cafes are at 10.30 in the morning in Singapore. So it's about 10.30 p.m. in the US, right? So, uh, so I, I got a few from the US. I, and I have, of course, Singaporean participants. Um, and then, so the US participants, some of them are seasoned uh, death cafe goers. And they would tell me, wow, you have a very young crowd. And usually um, the death cafes that they attend are attended by elderly people who have been through something in their lives, are dealing with an illness. And, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of conversations, I guess. But so far, a lot of the conversations that we've been having are, a lot of them are like philosophical sometimes. So, um. For example, uh, in the latest Death Cafe, uh, we started off talking about the Titan <laughs> because, uh, and then very quickly, it became a question about, would you want to know uh, when you're going to die, right? And then there's a whole philosophical discussion around that versus, I mean, there, there would be definitely some people who would talk about planning and that, oh, there should be more uh, services, blah, blah, blah. Where do I go to? You know, there are these knowledge or informative uh, questioning, but I find that a lot of our conversations are more nice. I, I want to say spiritual, but I'm also not sure whether that's the right word. Uh, but yeah, they, they are, there are a lot of stories that people share um, about their own grieving process or uh, their own experiences in life. I particularly remember um, I had an Indian participant. So I get, I get my international crowd from deathcafe.com. And I think that there are people who are interested to see what's the Asian perspective, right? Because um, I guess death cafes are not as common in, in, in Asia or at least on the deathcafe.com website. So I had an Indian participant who, and I remember we were we was sharing about like, where would you like to die? Right, I think that was the question that we were talking about, and 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 her response was very inspiring. And she was like, "Is there only one place that I can choose that I want to die?" Because to her, she's died many times, <laughs> like, and she has chosen like I guess the way that she looks at life is that there are many parts of her life, and as a being, and I guess phases in life that she finds that, oh, she has already died many times and why do I only have to choose one? I can choose to die in many places, you know? So it's, it's always very inspiring coming out of each death cafe session. Um, 
I find myself feeling more alive after the 90 minutes of death talk. And I think that the, the regular uh, monthly reminder and monthly, I guess, just community and sharing with like-minded people that, that really helps uplift that group of us who attend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's been quite exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So I know it's challenging because palliative care is naturally positioned at end of life. And even your name, end of life doulas, really reinforces the lateness of when people might connect with you. You know, I wonder what you think about how easy it would be to insert yourself or offer your services earlier in the illness story. I mean, what I call upstream in the illness. Do you think that would work? Um... I think it is. I think it is. Uh, it's just that okay, I guess from a making a living standpoint, I'm also as in there are many points in the entire journey that I can insert myself in and be useful. Uh, I guess it really depends on whether I am able to access the the points right as one, and two, uh, whether that is the place that I want to operate in as well. Because I think end of life doula, um, I guess uh, the the perception is really at the end of life. The way that I am interpreting this is that no, it's anytime you're ready, we can start talking. Um, and and it can also go beyond death to grieving, right? Uh so so which is maybe maybe why I have not narrowed down my service to something more marketable or more uh that I can articulate better. But I think I agree with you that um the the need is to bring the conversation upstream as early as possible, actually. Um, so I practice it with my daughter. I don't shy about talking about death. Um, I, don't, I don't talk about it. I don't not talk about it because it is uncomfortable. Uh, I make sure that I treat her as how, how I would treat an adult in talking about death. But wow. yes. Yeah. It is normalizing these conversations. And yes. it, I mean, I, I think it's so interesting. Yeah. I, I, you, I think you're right with the idea of inserting you, your, your services, your skills can be useful at different points. And we've talked to other doulas and it's in your name, end of life doula and death doula is not necessarily much better. So I think just like palliative care, it has a public perception challenge and and I wonder if the idea of sickness coach or illness coach is really what you can help people do because then it's it's A, not as scary, but you are coaching them, not just about conversations, but about coaching them on how to navigate, how to get information, how to you know navigate the system and get services or, or think about options. So it isn't only about supporting mm-hmm. wishes, but I think that there's a huge role for, did you know these services exist? This is how, you know, all those kinds of things. Or you really need to ask your doctor these questions because this is a this is going to fundamentally change the kinds of options that yeah. you have depending. Um, yeah. In fact, so, I, I think that it is part of uh, the job description of end-of-life doulas. It's just that people don't, usually I imagine they come to end-of-life doulas too late, that it's already like at end stage, right? As in, even though it, as in, okay, there is a, this is what I call the hospice zone, right? Where you are, you know that the end is in sight. There is a prognosis of X number of years or months versus if let's say I'm a cancer patient and I'm still undergoing treatment. I think that is also when this conversation would be important. But um, my, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so I think there's something that, perhaps will need to, it's maybe a systemic issue, right? There seems to be like a line where before palliative and after palliative, um, my sense is that in Singapore, once you cross the line, you're covered, right? All the services will just shower on you and you would have all the support. Yeah, from the government, from the social services, whatever. No, but you know, because, you're, you... because you're paying for it. I mean, I guess not, you're paying for for, but you do you do pay for the hospice services anyway. Yeah, but uh, it's quite heavily subsidized in Singapore, actually. Yeah, so when we have a few public services as well, do I? No, no, no. They are usually private run, but they're heavily subsidized. So once and and I think in Singapore, palliative care is there is a lot more a lot of conversations and policies, new policies coming in to support palliative care. Um, I think that they do understand that the silver wave, silver tide is coming 
and hospitals and hospices may not be sufficient. So there's actually a lot of emphasis to move palliative care to home palliative care and providing you know, the subsidies, et cetera, to enable that to happen. So there is a huge conversation happening in the palliative scene um, here. Uh, so to me, once you cross that line, you are, you are all right. And I don't feel like I need to operate in that zone. But it's really before this. And there are a lot of people who don't even cross the line, right? They just pass away before even getting a palliative care service. Um, or they don't know that they can access it and then they just struggle on their own, right? So, so I think that my, my zone is definitely here. But um, I, I hear you in that the disease coach is important. Um, it's just that I'm not sure how receptive, and this I'll need to try out, people would be to talk about death when they are trying to get a cure and they're trying to survive, right? So I think that is there is a very delicate balance um, in raising the issue, in even uh, broaching the subject. Yeah. So my I think my belief is that the conversation needs to be even further upstream to normalize it. I totally imagine someone like my daughter, if she has an, an, uh, an illness and I talk to her about her death plans, she would be open to it, right? Because she is, she has this, she understands that it's important to talk about it and it's not a big deal to talk about it, right? Yeah. So I feel like that work is important yeah. to get us to a point where we can talk about death during an illness yeah yeah so um, I, I, yes, yeah go ahead. I, no i would just i would just plant the seed for you to consider you're not only helping them plan for death you're also helping support living while dying we're all dying really but when you get yeah. sick you're it's much more you know uh in, it's much more real that you're dying and so you're not helping you're not only talking to them about their death you're helping them plan for their life while they're sick, which can include mm. treatment, but it can also include stopping treatment or the uncertainty of continuing or all those decisions. I mean, there are years and years of decisions in the system. So do you have any advice for patients or families or maybe the public that you would, you would from what you've experienced, what you would want to offer? Okay. Um, I think maybe the advice that I would give or rather something to think about is that don't assume don't assume that the other person is not ready to talk. <laughs> Although a lot of times it may, it may be the case, but if you are ready, I think, um, yeah, start the conversation. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Zia thank you so much for, for talking you. with us today. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. You can visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com to learn more about our movement and how you can join it. The podcast is produced by myself, Kayla McMillan, Valerie Bishop, Shilpa Jyothi Kumar, and Maggie Sivak. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketza.